Welcome to Open Heaven Inspiration. This is Mike Gast. For the past several weeks, we've been talking about forgiveness. I started with a series of teachings where I made several mentions up to one of my favorite teachers on this subject, Dr. Brian Adams. Dr. Adams, the author of The Power of Forgiveness, has a miracle healing ministry that takes him across this nation and into the Mideast, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. He's been featured on Sid Ross, It's Supernatural, and frequently appears on numerous media venues. But today, we're blessed and honored to have him on Open Heaven Inspiration. Welcome, Dr. Adams. Well, hello, my friend. It is always a pleasure to get to fellowship with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, let, before we get this going, I just want to let you all know that we are going to have a good time on this broadcast because Dr. Adams teaches. When he teaches, he goes deep, he goes wide, and he has fun. So before we start going deep and wide, how would you like to tell us about the ministry that you're doing internationally in the midst of this pandemic? Well, you know, immediately we saw that they were restricting flights and entering people into countries. So uh, not just myself, but so many ministers like yourself and others, they're like, we can't allow the enemy or any sickness, disease, virus, flu, or germ to shut us down. Now pay attention to this. This is a powerful scripture. It says, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Now let me give you a little teaching here. Sickness is the fruit of sin. So if where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, then where COVID abounds, the grace or the power or the authority to overcome it, to resist it, to bypass it, to trod and step and have it underneath your foot. You know, many times when sickness or disease or symptoms come, we make the average declaration, oh, I don't feel well. Oh, I'm catching a flu. I want to encourage you. Don't catch something unless it's going to be catch a healing. Walk in the divine power of God. Well, I begin to see people doing Zim and Zoom and Instagram and different venues just like this. Next thing you know, every Wednesday, I'm doing an Instagram video to the underground church of Iran. I'm doing Zoom meetings to South Africa and to countries there. Uh, we're communicating over video, uh, video media, media, excuse me. <laughs> I'm getting the Holy Ghost all over me. It's getting me flabbergasted. Yeah, uh, Dr. Uh, media before you go on, Dr. Adams, I just want to repeat what he just said. Don't say, can you tell us that one more time about what to catch and what not to catch? You know, quit trying to catch uh, sickness and you know, say, oh, I think I'm catching the flu. I think I'm catching the cold. Just catch a healing. Catch a healing from the word of God. To see, you're not healed because the pain left or the pain's there. You're healed because the word of God says so. So remember, faith doesn't deny reality. Faith defies reality. It pushes against it. It breaks its power. Jesus, my friend, he never calmed the storm for Peter, who was a first-time water walker. He had him get out in the midst of the storm. You know what? My wife read me something she saw on social media when all this first happened. And a lady put a thing out and said, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. Some people in their boat in this storm of this pandemic, uh, their finances have not been touched and the finances are still coming in. But some people are in a boat in the same storm that their jobs they've lost, they can't get unemployment, they, they don't have no money in their need. Other people are in a boat where they're like, I don't care if I got a mask on or not, it doesn't bother me. But some people are, are in a boat saying, Hey, my mom and dad and people in my family have died because of lung and breathing conditions. I have COPD. And, man, they got to have a, a, uh, a mask on and stuff. So no matter what boat you're in, in this pandemic storm, I want to encourage you, just be kind. Even if your boat and your conditions is different, don't judge or belittle or speak down on, on people. And just know, don't let your liberty cause others to sin. I really don't need a mask. Uh, I, I've been in leper colonies and prayed for the whole leper colony to not caught leprosy. I'm in prayer lines in African places 
to where uh, the first person will come up and say, I got tuberculosis. Next person will say, I got cholera. Next person will say, I got leprosy. There'll be all these contagious diseases that just surviving one of my prayer lines would kill the average believer in America. But God has taught me that in his name, in his power, is the power, in his word, is the power to perform what he said. So uh, I, I just say I don't need this stuff, but I also know we got to obey the laws of the land. And uh, uh, the Lord gave me a scripture. He says, don't let your liberty or your feeling you don't need one cause others to stumble. So I carry them in my car. I go into a store. I wear it because people will get mad at you if you don't. And then when they're mad at you, they're close to receiving the gospel from you. Now, what's more important, your, your right to not wear a mask or winning somebody to Jesus? You know, sometimes we have to be humble. Jesus, when he dispatched his disciples, he said, be as wise as wolves, but harmless as doves. We need to let and reflect the gentleness of the Holy Spirit. And we need to network with heaven and become distributors of the power of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God and all these things that God says is available from heaven to earth. Many times, the only way heaven's going to get here on earth is through you, where you become a portal, you become a window to, uh, to show and let people experience the love of God. Here's what I tell people. You're supposed to become the visible image of the invisible God. So in this pandemic, praise God, pray for others, let things go. People, uh, you know, at the, at the end of last year, <clears throat> I told people, this 2020, it's going to be just like the word 2020. We're going to see clearly. We're going we're to have clear vision. We're going to see what's going on. When all this happened, none of us actually, I don't think too many of us saw this coming. They said, well, so much for your prophetic word on seeing clearly. I said, well, no, not exactly. I see that. Faith that isn't tested isn't faith at all. And people in the body of Christ were really seeing where their faith is. They'll use this uh, pandemic and, quote, fear of uh, social distancing will keep them from coming to church. But they'll go to the bingo hall. They'll go to the movie. They'll get on airplanes. I just flew to Amarillo the other day. No spacing, seat by seat, side by side. The plane was full. And everybody, they had to wear a mask. But they won't let churches be full, but they'll let airplanes be full. They'll let people riot and be there with no social distancing. So something tells me that we've got to learn that if you're going to be a wet water walker and walk in faith, you can't stay being a dry boat rider and wait for the storm to stop and become successful in the kingdom of God. Big amen. You're already on a roll, Dr. Adams. <laughs> so you, you have done, been doing ministry internationally over Zoom and other venues. Can you tell us some of the experiences or the highlights that you're seeing right now? Oh, uh, well, because of how I was taught and how I believe, uh, there is no distance in the spirit realm. And the Bible says, whatsoever you believe us, and saith shall be given unto you. So when I'm doing these Zoom meetings or uh, meetings like this, sometimes in Zooms they have all the people watching around, I would click on their pictures, and when I see their face, I say, hi, how you doing? They'll talk back to me. I'll begin to prophesy. Or I'll say, you got any pains or problems? They're like, yeah, put your hand there. And pray for them right on the Zoom meeting. They would get healed, start moving, or, oh, my gosh, the pain's gone. Or I would give a prophetic word, but then – because prophecy needs to be judged, I would say, does that bear witness with you? And they'll be like, did my pastor tell you that or what's going on? Just, I said, no, I just believe I heard that, but I need to test it because <clears throat> I told you earlier, and I'll say it with everybody listening, the prophetic accuracy of the church is 50%. We're right or we're wrong. So all you quote prophets and prophetess and, and, and master prophets and people who think you're never wrong, I just rebuke you so kindly and gently. I love you, but you're wrong. Every word needs to be judged. The Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the spirit of the prophet. What that means is we need to judge the word because it says we prophesy in part. If you prophesy in part, honey, you can't be perfect. You're only in part. You see dimly through a glass. We know in part. 
We prophesy in part. Let's quit acting. You know what, Mike? We need to quit making the gifts of gods become little gods. Mm. You mm. know what? Uh, he didn't have any perfect people to use, so God got stuck with using imperfect people like me. Mm. We're just the donkey that he rides in on. And the sad thing about it is, on the day Christ rode a new, not used, not previously owned, but an unridden new donkey, he stuck with an old beat up used, many miles. You know what? I'll bet you he even checked Carfax when he checked this old donkey out. But in spite of my sins, and I was, oh my gosh, I was telling a lady this the other day on an interview. He came into my darkness and he courted me. Mm. I can look back on my past. I remember times being stoned on drugs, acid, drunk, that the spirit of God would come. And, and, and I didn't like, oh, there's a spirit of God. But I would find myself talking to him. And now I look back, I thought he was not afraid of my sin and my condition. And he was courting me. I guess kind of like God standing outside the cave when Elijah was hiding in his shame. And he said, what are you doing in there? Come out. He was saying, come on out, Brian. I got something for you. I'll never forget the day I prayed and said, if you can take my nothing and do something with it. I thought that was a powerful prayer. You know, I'm like, I need to put that in a book somewhere. But now I know he even gave me the idea to say it because <laughs> I was so burnt out. I was so dumb. I didn't even know how to pray. But the spirit will give you the words or give you the utterances. Man, I'm telling you, forgiveness is where it's at. Love is where it's at. Out of one blood, God created all mankind. If you're an African-American, you're my brother from another mother. You're my sister from another mister. If you're Native American, you know, there's been atrocious things of the past and history, but my Bible says forgetting the past and letting it go. Mm -hmm. You can't say, but this happened, that happened. Become obedient to the word of God. Let the past go and let's rise up and show the love of God. God's not backing any riots. God's not backing any fires and, and looting. God is not the author of confusion. So quit wasting your time asking him to bless your confusion. Mm -hmm. He won't bless what he hasn't authored. That stuff's of man. Remember, the scripture tells us, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Let me say The wrath of man or the anger or the getting even of man, that's not biblical. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Come on. That's like sitting a little tiny Japanese baby in the middle of a room and saying, it's your fault that Japan bombed the Hawaii, Pearl Harbor. That ain't that child's fault. That was the past. Let it go. Let's go on. We've got a harvest. We've got souls to win. God says, until the gospel is preached into all the world. You know, in Pakistan, there's people in brick kilns that are slaves right now, and they need people in America to donate money to pay their debt to get them from being slaves. Their children and their wives can be sexually abused because they're slaves. Uh, if, they're, if they're mad at them, they can cut their arms off and beat them. I just saw a thing today where a man in Pakistan was killed because they said he blasphemed by sending texts. Hey, we get offended because someone takes our parking spot. Quit giving to offense. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. How quickly you get offended it really shows us the level of your immaturity. Because a person that is mature, he lets the little stuff go. When you put on the forearm of God and pray in the Holy Ghost, when you put on the, the full love of God and allow it to go from your brother and sister, you'll actually become like Teflon. Remember those Teflon skillets? And it won't stick to you. Love, my friend is the fuel of faith, because the Bible says, faith worketh by love. Dr. Adams, um, you are on full tilt today, and I think people are loving it. But what I'd like to do, uh, quickly, I just want to acknowledge a few friends that are here. We've got uh, John Burgess, Pastor John and his wife, uh, great supporters of this ministry. We have, <laughs> we have Wanda Turpin. We and which I think must be one of your friends. And we got uh, Carter, and uh, that's who we have on board so far. But 
Uh, but Dr. Adams, so let's dial back just a little bit. And I want to take our listeners through a little journey of your life, how you started mm. to the place where you received this revelation on forgiveness. So the one thing that we're missing on this broadcast is a leather couch for this question. And that is, and just so folks are familiar, I'm going to ask him, what is your childhood like? And typically a psychologist will ask their patient to sit, to lay down on a couch and share that. Well, I won't tell you how I feel about my mother. I sure do love her. I sure do miss her. Praise God that I had a praying mother. That's why I am. Remember when Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, your faith, which began in your grandmother Eunice. Oh, my gosh. My grandmother Eva would take my mama to church, and my mama would take me to church. Even though the church we went to had a form of godliness but didn't have no power. Uh, in my childhood, even though I had a Christian mother, I had a paranoid schizophrenic biological father who she didn't stay with long because he, he abused us children and her. But he burnt me with cigarettes uh, as a little baby, would drop me on the floor and kick me. Once found out, you know, I was taken from that situation. But I was sexually abused, verbally abused, uh, physically abused. Even when my mother remarried, I had a stepfather that wouldn't beat her, but he would beat me with a two by four from the small of my back to, to my ankles. Hurt people, ladies and gentlemen, will hurt people. Abuse people will abuse people. The cycle will continue. And so it will with you. Now, you heard me say sexually, verbally, physically abused. Let me share something awesome with you. Even though those things were done to me, it's not my identity. I am not a victim. I am a victor. All things past are dead and gone. I was so, I didn't have a drug problem as a teenager. I had a reality problem. I was told by an older sister, because I'm the baby of the family, you're nothing, you're nobody, you'll never be loved, you'll never be married, you'll never have any success, you're a failure. I quit school two weeks into 10th grade. I was so trained for failure. The devil used my sister as a puppet. He was the puppet master. What's really funny is I eventually, years later after getting saved, became the pastor of that sister and my mother's pastor. That was so awesome. But all those things led me to escape reality through drugs. My addiction became so strong that uh, I became a drug dealer in order to pay because I didn't want to rob houses or, or hurt people and rob people. So I, I just became a party animal. Come to my house, there's a party. When they'd get there, I'd say, I have these drugs for sale. It paid for my usage of drugs. Uh, but, you know, it came to a place that sin is pleasurable for a season, but all the pain and all the mocking voices, you're nothing, you're nobody, you'll never be loved. So I never tried to have any relationship more than a one-night stand. Uh, I was abused, so, of course, I abused. Hurt people, hurt people. Abuse people, abuse people. But praise God, I'm finally in a, in a, in a time zone in my life to where – now I've got something to add to that. Healed people heal people. Amen. Praise God. So yeah, I, had praise God. Things. I had the drug usage, but even though I was going to become, quote, the great drug dealer, taking drugs from Florida to Ohio, and, and was going to be the party animal and, and the womanizer, I had a severe problem. And that severe problem was I had a praying mother who wouldn't stop praying, getting in the devil's face, getting in God's face, saying, this is my child, DNA, blood rights. I have authority over him because I'm a spiritual covering because he's not saved. And she prayed. Now, you may not like this or understand it or even agree with it, but she prayed until my life became even more miserable. I came to a place to where I was ready to commit suicide. I came back down to the Jackson County area from Columbus, and I tried overdosing with drugs, but no matter how many thousands of dollars of drugs I took, I couldn't die. And then I got in a car, was going to wreck the car. And then just before I did, I had this weird thought that, wow, I've never killed myself before. So uh, I wonder if I have to make reservations. So I went up on a hill to try to talk to heaven to see if I had to make reservations before I died. But when I got up there, I began to think, wow, you know what? Uh, I'm nobody. I'm busted, disgusted, can't be trusted. The creator of the world won't even know who I am. 
He's not going to answer me. I'll probably get a voice recording that says, uh, press one if you're suicidal, press two if you need groceries. Or maybe some little chubby angel would come down and say, go take a shower, brush your teeth. You look disgusting. I had long hair. Was all I hadn't bathed in weeks. Was strung out on drugs and alcohol. But a little video played in my head. My mama was bouncing me on her knee as a baby. And she said, not knowing she was programming me for survival. She said, son, if you ever get in a situation you can't handle, call on the name of Jesus. Mm. Now, many of you that's had drug problems might have gone through a 12 step. And if that works for you, great. But I was too high to count the 12. So I just counted one. I took one step back, leaned my head back, screamed Jesus at the top of my lungs. And all of a sudden, a shiver went through my body. I was no longer high. I was no longer drunk. But then the lies of the devil had to begin to fall because I was nobody. Then why did Jesus show up? And how did he know my first name? Wow. The creator mm -hmm. of the world knew me by name. He said, Brian, you never. I, first he said, I love you, which is what I needed to hear. I love you. And you never have to get high again. Man, this summer I'm celebrating 36 years drug and alcohol free by the power of the spirit of God. Woo. I've been getting high on the Holy Ghost ever since. Amen. So that's how you came to Christ. Just sounds like kind of a, a run of the mill conversion, Dr. Adams. <laughs> but, uh, Just every day, you know, I was bored, had nothing else to do. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do this. But you know, I got this. I keep getting weird thoughts. I'm just a weird person. Uh, I apologize for the people who can't handle weird, but I am weird. God anoints my weird to reach the other weird people because there's a whole bunch of them out there. They're probably related to me. But I thought, wow, I was, I was working for the devil. I was a drug dealer. Now that I'm saved, maybe I should become a cop. So I went to school at night and weekends and became an Ohio certified police officer. I had no record and not been arrested and became an auxiliary deputy sheriff on a SWAT team working undercover narcotics. Uh, by this time, I'd met my wife and was, was married to her. And she would, she was, uh, uh, you know, we were going to church and, and uh, she would be like, you're not called to be a cop. You're called to be a preacher. Oh, she bugged me, got in my face. Finally, she started saying, uh, God, he won't listen to me. I'll duck and you hit him. So she put a spiritual hit on me in the, I say in the kingdom and said, I've got all ducking you hitting. One day I come home. She, she, I was happy playing. I was a former Marine. So I love the guns. I love the, the law enforcement. Uh, one day I come home. She's crying. I said, what are you crying for? And she looked at me and I can tell she's getting ready to talk. So I'm really listening. And, you know, just like in, with Peter in the Bible said, and he looked at him expecting to receive something. I was looking at her, expecting to hear what the problem was. And of course, the problem was me. She said, don't you care about the hundreds of thousands of souls that are assigned to your call? Oh, it was like I'd been kicked in the gut. Mm. I turned around and walked out. I had my, my SWAT uniform on the black, got in my truck, drove away crying. The conviction began. And then I went and was on a drug raid. We arrested a guy. I'm taking him up the steps of the sheriff's office. He's handcuffed. The power of God dropped on me where I began weeping. My partner came out. He thought he kicked me, headbutt me or something. And uh, he knew I was a believer. <clears throat> he goes, what happened? What happened? I said, it's a God thing. Well, he was convicted. He didn't want to hear preaching. So he grabbed the guy and he took off inside with him. And while the power of God was on me, I heard him speak. And he said, son, I haven't called you to imprison people. I've called you to set the captive free. And that was the beginning of where I hung up my bands. So powerful. I've been preaching the gospel ever since. Well, Dr. Adams, that is such a powerful calling. But I have a feeling that there might be some folks listening that, that have another kind of calling. And maybe it's not as dramatic as yours, but they need a nudge, whether it's a, you know, a Bible study or however the Lord wants to take them. Do you have any advice for them? Well, look at this hand. A lot of people say, man, this guy's got big hands. I do have big hands. It seemed like when I was a kid, they were small. I guess I grew up. But my hands were big. But if I cut this hand off, if I stopped the bleeding, all of my body would survive, but my hand would die. So part of the biggest reasons is a lot of people bought the lie 
I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Mm. And see, if you, you know, I was telling my wife the other day, we were talking about some people. I said, if you don't love people, you can't be right with God. If you're not right with people, you're not right with God. And to be a Christian means to be Christ-like. And all through the Bible, all we see is it says, as was his routine, as was his custom, he went to the tabernacle almost every day. A lot of people try to use a scripture that says the disciples went home to home breaking bread and having fellowship. But then the same paragraph, they, they, only, they only quote uh, part B of that paragraph. The first part says they went to the tabernacle daily. So they did go to church, not just the home churches. They went to the tabernacle. Now, it was so persecuted that they could be killed with, so they weren't building churches like we got in America. But check it out. God gave gifts to fivefold ministers to equip the saints. You become born again. You are a baby. You're a baby Christian. Now, the devil is going to attack the babies. You have no protection. They have no shepherd. If you got sheep running around out here where I live, or little dogs, the coyotes will come and get them. They have to be, your animals have to be pinned. They have to be protected. So what happens is, uh, uh, my, my prophet friend says this, God loves babies, but God can't use babies. God gave fivefold ministers to equip the saints. You need to be taught. You need to be equipped. Without a foundation laid on you from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, where he talks about the doctrines of Christ, repentance of dead works, uh, faith toward God, laying on of hands, doctrine of baptisms, uh, uh, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Without these doctrinal things in you, your foundation is not secure enough where God will not build on you. He will not promote you. I've seen Christians that live their life, yeah, I'm a believer. But, you know, it's just like saying, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, but you never vote. You never participate in anything but complain. See, I was in Israel and the Lord told me, he said, son, you can't seek the head and not seek the body. I'm more than a head. I have a body. For You know what? I got a big old nose and I got a mouth. Uh, we stopped at Pizza Hut today. And when you order a large pizza, they give you these cinnamon sticks. My wife was driving. I was sitting in the passenger seat. So they passed it through the window. <clears throat> she set it right in front of me. So I had to wait all the way home to get into that pizza, but I couldn't even smell the pizza because the cinnamon rolls, the smell was so beautiful. You know that during that ride home, I was in love with my nose. Praise God for my nose because I could smell those. But when it came time for my mouth to do something, my, I didn't resent my nose. You see what I'm saying? Each person has a part. The Amen. Bible, when each person, now listen to this, when each person supplies his part, then the church grows. So Amen. I'm going to give you a revelation you maybe never heard of. I hope it convicts you because that's what the, I'm not condemning you. I want to convict you because that leads you to repentance. If each person supplies his part, then the body grows. If you don't go to church and supply your part, you're guilty of the sin of hindering church growth. Hmm. You are supposed to become the answer to somebody's prayers. You know, <clears throat> we see people come to the church and they come in and they say, how are you doing? Oh, too blessed to be stressed. Praise the Lord. I'm so blessed. You know, before COVID, we even never heard of COVID. People were coming wearing masks to church, telling everybody they're okay, putting on a religious mask. When mm. you know what they went through to get there. They're, they're hoping somebody hears from God to give them five bucks so their car don't run out of gas. Their husbands are jealous of the church because he the church has become the, the other man in the life because they love to go there. And so they might have got hit or fought or anything else. If you go, you could be the person that shakes a hand, smiles, loves someone. You could be that person, you know, it says exhort one another daily. You are called to be somebody's cheerleader. Amen. It's all about you you become selfish and narcissistic. Mm. You know, I, I work, I, I have a ministry of reconciliation. And in the ministry of reconciliation, we see people healed. I don't have a healing ministry. In the ministry of, of getting people back to God, I see people delivered of demons, but I don't have a deliverance ministry. Mm. Those signs follow me because I'm a believer in Christ. See, never let your gifting 
become your identity. The gifts and callings of God should not be worn as badges of honor, but they should fit in your tool belt, just like a hammer or a tape measure. These are things just to build the body of Christ. Man, the people that God has used to speak into my life, to bring me correction, that's right. You're supposed to be corrected because God didn't call you or save you because you were gorgeous. I know some of you are like, oh, my gosh. God didn't call you because you had money or because you're so pretty or so perfect. You were lost and you were broken and you were hurt. Now trust God in people. Trust him. Yes, everybody there in the church is not a place of perfection. It's a, a group of people that's been hurt. You know what? If you don't pass the test, you got to take it again. But if you don't go to class to study for the test, you're going to keep failing the test. Dr. Adams, thank you so much for sharing that. I have a feeling that every pastor who sees this is going to be sharing it with their <laughs> congregation. And, and I love to be in church. So what, one thing I would like to do here is I would really like to get into the, you know, get into the depth of this subject on the power of forgiveness. You've already touched on it, but when I look at your book and, and folks, I highly recommend this book because it will really take you into the healing. It'll take you into healing. It'll just take you into the, as we said before, the depth and the breadth of what the word of God has to say. So if you can tell us how you received this revelation. Uh, I was seeking the supernatural and everybody told me, you got to go to a third world country to see miracles. So I had a friend that he would always have testimonies of miracles happen when he went to Africa. So I got my passport and, and I went to Africa with him and oh my gosh, did I ever see miracles. An entire deaf and dumb school was shut down, not by me, Frank, by him. Uh, blind eyes were open. Five out of seven people got out of wheelchairs. Not by me again. I was just an observer. But I saw it. I longed for it. I wanted it. On the way home, the Holy Spirit woke me up on the plane because it was like a 17-hour flight. And he said, Brian, that what you've seen in Africa, I'll do for you anywhere if you dare to believe. I'm not a respecter of continents. And when he said, I'm not a respecter of continents, I realized that this was for everywhere, not just third world nations. And so I started a Bible school called Dare to Believe His Healing Touch. Uh, it had a little television program along the Ohio River, Dare to Believe His Healing Touch. And uh, we went with my pastor. And the Lord called me after coming back from this trip to a 40-day fast. Of course, my carnal flesh resisted that for a few days. But eventually, he uh, awoke in me and told me to, to get on with it. So he graced me and gave me the power to do 40 days, no food, water only. Now, I was expecting great revelation. I was expecting to have visitations, leave my body, go to heaven, go to hell, come back with these great things. And, well, actually, the only thing happened, I was hungry for 40 days. <laughs> and uh, there was much Bible reading and much praying and seeking. But right at the very end of the fast, he spoke to me one line. That's all it was, one line. He said, faith moves me, but forgiveness releases my power. So I began to study this. It was like a little, uh, little email. It's like, you got mail. Faith moves me, but forgiveness releases my power. So I began to study, and he took me to Matthew 18, to a guy who owed 10,000 talents, uh, was brought in to pay, was going to be put in jail. He cried out for mercy, and the Lord gave him mercy. He left, he found a guy owed him only 100. Now remember, he'd been forgiven 10,000. He told the guy, pay me up or I'll put you in jail. The guy said, please give me mercy and help me. He wouldn't and threw him in debtor's prison. Word got back to the Lord who'd forgiven him 10,000. He required him to come before him. And he said, shouldn't you have forgiven this guy this little bit when I forgive you for all? Because you didn't, you'll be turned over to the tormentors. And all of a sudden I realized that Torment has fear. The Bible says fear has torment. So I started saying, if you forgive, if you don't forgive, you'll be turned over to the tormentors. So I started uh, experimenting with phobias and fears and anxieties and asked people, how long have you had that? They say five years. What happened? I came home, caught my husband with another man. I said, okay, let's forgive him. Of course, people have the mistake thinking to forgive is to condone. But when God forgave you of your sins, he wasn't condoning your sins. 
He was rescuing you from your sins. So when you forgive someone that's done you wrong, and I agree, you've been done wrong, you're not condoning him <clears throat> or that person. You're not uh, rescuing them from it. You're rescuing yourself, but you're obeying God who commands us. It's called the, it's one of the laws of the universe. You cannot be forgiven if you don't forgive. Then I started experimenting with fibromyalgia, with arthritis, bursitis, and people have been prayed by all these people and couldn't get healed. We would not ask them if they had unforgiveness because most people with their lips but not with their heart have forgiven. So we will pray the prayer of forgiveness. They'll start to weep or cry a lot of times. Now remember, the devil is not only a liar, the devil is a legalist. And he's found somehow legal ground to be in your life. Once we remove that legal ground, then we can command him to leave. Dr. Adams, I have, I have to ask you a question here. You made a very significant statement about forgiving people from their lips, but not from their heart. If someone is listening today, how do they know the difference? Well, you'll usually feel it. When I pray with someone, I, I say the prayer like this. I make a conscious decision to forgive everybody that's hurt me, abused me, or done me wrong. I uh, not only forgive them, but I forgive myself. Because you might be mad at yourself because you keep going back to that same relationship. You keep committing the same sin. You keep making the same mistake. You said, I'll never do it again, but you always do it again. Or you might be uh, mad at God. Let me read you a scripture real quick. Found in the book of Acts, chapter 24, 16. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I exercise myself daily to have a conscience void of offense toward God and towards men. This is the Apostle Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, author of two-thirds of the New Testament or so. He said he had to exercise. Now, that means he had to work at it because in this world you have problems. The church, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, people were fasting, shaving their heads, saying they're going to kill him. I'm not going to eat until he died. They were stoning him. He, he wasn't getting the key to the city in parades. He was getting ran out of towns and threatened to be killed. So he said, I have to work at forgiving. We normally rehearse the offense and what's been done wrong to us. But now we have to rehearse the forgiveness. No, I forgave that person. I know I just saw him in Walmart again. And man, that my gut got all stirred up. Devil, stop it. Shut up. I am obeying God. I am a, I have networked with heaven. I become a distributor of forgiveness. I forgive them. I release them. Just like Jesus said, oh, brother, I love it when we're talking about the vertical forgiveness. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, he not only forgave them, but you know you're really tapped in forgiveness when you can say, God, I ask you to forgive them. Then you really forgive them when you're able to say, Lord, bless them. Not, not as reward for sin, but just because that's how God rolls. <laughs> He's a God of grace. Grace is being empowered and gifted for something you don't deserve. Hey, I want to reap forgiveness. I want to reap grace and mercy. So I make it a practice to give it. I never try to find somebody that least deserves it. I always deal with people that need it the most, that have done me the, the that have stolen from me, ripped me off. Oh my gosh. Uh, whatever your revelation, Mike, from heaven, that will appear to be your warfare here on earth. Because anything from heaven, the fallen earth and the princes of this world, they don't want that revelation because it's light and it's truth. So they're going to fight against it. Jesus asked Peter, who do they say I am? He says, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of God. He and Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. Now, so Peter's revelation from heaven is I know who you are. When Christ was taken into custody, a little slave girl that had no authority, had no uh, uh, dominion or authority to punish Peter, said, you're one of them, you're a Galilean. I could tell it by, one of them said, I could tell by your accent, you the Galilean accent. And the man who was the first to receive from heaven of the disciples, because John the Baptist knew who he was by an open vision, but he said, he said, I know who you are. Now he's saying, I don't know him. His revelation became his warfare. Mm, yeah. So when heaven revealed to me about forgiveness, I knew 
that my warfare was now going to be a fence. I'm not talking a barbed wire fence. I'm talking a fence. Yeah. People lying, people stealing, people threatening my life, people challenging me. And I have to immediately just take a deep breath, relax, and say, Father, I forgive them. But then, because after all the years of having this revelation, my revelation, if I'm steward of it, remember the guys that got gifts? You gave me five, I now have ten. I'm held responsible to take this revelation to a new level. Mm, amen. So now I say, Father, I forgive them in Jesus' name. I do it instantly. Right while Christ was on the cross, while he was being persecuted, while he was being abused, right while this was happening, he forgave. So the minute I get the phone call, the minute someone cusses me, the minute some, I just say, I forgive, I forgive. But then I take a step farther and I say, Father, I ask you to forgive this person of every sin that is not a sin unto death. You said you would do this. Now I've actually used forgiveness as an evangelistic tool because God said, if they have sinned a sin, it's not a sin unto death. If you ask me, I will forgive them. Remember my revelation. Faith moves God, but forgiveness releases his power. So if I ask God to forgive someone's sins, it's not unto death, and God forgives them, his power, which is the Holy Spirit, is loose or released. The person of the Holy Spirit is released upon that person. Now he begins to convict him. Dr. Adams, you, you're mentioning sin is not unto death. I have a feeling some folks might be wondering, what is a sin unto death? Okay, <laughs> there's a couple of different places. The Bible is not very detailed in that. But the first thing I asked the Lord, I feel he told me, he says, it's a sin when I tell you, stop doing it or I'm going to take you home. You're going to die. Okay, uh, there are certain sins that, of course, the wages of sin is death. But when there's sins uh, uh, that one of the sins of the death is, is to where you're not born again. So I can't say, I ask you to make them born again. He says, okay, they're now born again. You see what I'm saying? There's sins of omission, the sins of non omissions Sins because you did something and sins because you didn't do something. Samuel said, I will not sin against the Lord by not praying for you. So once you've been, been engrafted into the vine and, and see, everybody that's born again and got the Holy Ghost can have gifts working through them because the Holy Ghost has gifts. But then there's a different set of gifts. The Bible says Jesus gave gifts. And the gave gifts, uh, the, when the Lord called me into the ministry, he said, this day I call you as an apostle, as a preacher. And the minute he said preacher, I knew I had a ton of an evangelist. So but he builds churches, covers multiple, multiple churches. Well, there's different levels of prophets, different levels of apostles. I'm more of just a sent one, sent to the world with a gift of faith to bring about the supernatural, introducing God into the world. So when you say, Lord, I ask you to forgive them for every sin that's not a sin unto death. Because he said, I won't forgive them for that sin. That's a sin that you have to deal with between you and God. So there, there are different levels of sin. All other sins are uh, against the uh, outside the body, but the sin of fornication and adultery is against the body. Amen? Do you see what I'm saying? That's so excellent, Doctor Adams. You know, have a detailed answer, but it's just like I've been praying in tongues for thirty-six years. I had no idea what I'm saying, but I love it. <laughs> Thank you for breaking that down for us. You know, something in your book that I thought was so valuable was you had separate chapters that talked about unforgiveness towards God, unforgiveness towards self, and unforgiveness towards others. And, and you've been touching on that in this interview. But by and large, where do people struggle the most? Uh, you know what? I have prayer lines with 100, 200, 300 people sometimes. I sit two chairs down and I tell people, now you don't have to worry about me pushing you down or falling down. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, and, and that doubled my prayer line. And they all have different stories. It depends on what season or what you're going through in your life. I remembered my mother had hip surgery and she got some fluid in her lungs. So she got pneumonia. Hip surgery went perfect, but now she's in a coma. I went to the lady next to her in ICU. They said, you're a preacher. Could you come over and give the last rites? 
I went over the daughter. Uh, I could tell she couldn't hear out of one ear. She kept turning her head. I prayed for her and God opened her ear. Uh, the rest of the family standing there was amazed because they knew the sister. The whole family got saved. I prayed for the woman and the woman who was dying got up healed, got dressed and told the doctor, I'm going home. He said, you can't go home. I'm, you're dying. She said, not anymore. And I said, woo, glory to God. I remember doing this right here. You know, it's like, woo. I said, now I'm warmed up, Jesus. Let's go over and pray for my mama and raise my mama. I went to the room next, prayed for my mother, and she died. Mm. I, I tried not to be mad. <laughs> Phew. That's been five or six years. It still touches my soul. I remember I said, hey, I work for you. Isn't there any company benefits? I should have special juice, special power for my mama. I'm the baby of the family. And it took me a while to work through that. And, 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 I, and I, I had this revelation. And I said, God, God, I'm not mad at you. Yes, I am. I felt like it was like, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me not. I'm like, I'm mad at God. And I'm not mad at God. I'm mad at God. And I had a miracle service in Canada. Probably the worst miracle service I ever did in my life. I'm like, be here, be here, be here. I'm like, yeah. If you ain't going to have my mom, I don't care if anybody else dies. I was like a little kid pouting. And I had to pull my thoughts captive. And four years ago, prior to my mom dying, I had uh, prophesied to her in a service. I said, uh, heaven wants you, but earth needs you. But when you die, you're going to go and be used by God to raise aborted children and miscarried children. Now, my mom was a 50-year uh, children's church worker. She loved kids. She had so many grandchildren, great and great, great, great grandchildren. She loved kids. When she heard that, she said it took the fear of dying away from her. Well, about four weeks or so after my mother died, I'm trying to recover from this offense toward God. And a guy came up and said, hey, I got a word about your mom. I heard your mama die. I got a word. And I was like, I called my wife over because people say, Jesus needs another angel. I probably would have smacked him because I'm like, people say dumb stuff. It's better to be silent than to say dumb stuff when death. So I called my wife wherever she came and she stood next to me. And the guy said, your mother, this sounds crazy, but I hear God saying to tell you, your mother heard you praying for her to get up, but she had already seen the children that she was going to work with and they needed her, needed her more than you needed her. Fascinating. And, she, and that statement, they need me more than you need me, was a statement my mom used to make my sister so mad. My sisters would get jealous how my mom treated the grandkids better than us kids. And she said, now, girls, they need me more than you. This guy didn't know this. You know, yeah. I realized, yeah, we got a guard praying our will. Because my mama's will was to go. <laughs> And so we can get mad at God because we prayed for the marriage, but the guy went ahead and went out on you and left you, or the woman left you. God, I'm having trouble with the job, and I'm praying and fasting, but I got fired anyway. And it's so much easier to blame God who we can't see than to take responsibility that maybe we got fired because we're a jerk. <laughs> maybe it's a character flaw or a character issue. or, or just yes. Sometimes in this fallen world, bad things happen even to good people. We can get mad at ourselves because uh, we said we'd never call that guy again, but we kept him in our cell phone. We should have taken the number up, but we didn't. And he used us again, and we fell into sin, and, and we got drunk again. Or the doctor get told us, take two tablets, but you take five, crush them up, and snort them. You're still a drug addict, even though the doctor prescribed them. So you can be mad at yourself for sin, for disobedience. You can be mad at your mama and dad. My biological father abused me, burnt me with cigarettes. I can't remember the six months old, but that's what other siblings told me. So one day I'm reading, honor your father and mother. And I said, God, how can I honor this guy who was abusive to me? How can I forgive him? And the Lord said, I want you to honor his position. I'll judge his performance. Mm. I'm just going to let that be quiet there for a little bit. Amen. So I forgave his performance and gave it to God. God is the judge of our performance. I can now honor my biological father so that that first commandment with the promise could come to pass in my life and I could be blessed and live I think, a life. I think a lot of people need to hear that because I haven't met anyone yet who had perfect parents. 
Yes. You know, I always jokingly say I'm a, I was a stepchild and I, uh, I, I am a stepfather. And uh, I was so mad at my stepkids one time and I was complaining to God. You know, we, we always complain to God. But I'm driving to the sheriff's office. I said, I said, God, these kids are spawns of the devil. Uh, they just don't understand I'm the answer to their prayers. If they listen to me, their life would be successful. Oh, the pride and the idiot that I was. Then all of a sudden, I looked up to heaven. I said, you guys are perfect. Why am I talking to you? I live in this fallen world. I'm a fallen person. Even though I'm a believer, you guys are just perfect. And it was quiet, and I drove down the road, and the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, and he said, hey, Brian, Jesus was a stepchild. Joseph wasn't his father. The Bible names his brothers by names and said he had sisters. Well, at least he must have had two if it's plural. So all of a sudden I realized he had brothers and sisters, same mom, different dad. He was from a dysfunctional family just like me. Matter of fact, I'm writing a book called Jesus Was a Stepchild. So whether it's a step parent or a mother, sometimes people are mad because my dad never played sports with me, taught me to play sports. He wasn't there. He wasn't there for me. So we can have unforgiveness as someone, what they didn't do, or we can have unforgiveness towards someone because of what they did. But either way, we need to forgive and we need to let it go so that we can be free. And the devil, I'll say it again, he's not only a liar, but he's a legalist. He's looking for a legal ground to stand in the court of heaven and say, God, I know you want to bless them, but I've got proof that they're in sin, and because of the laws of the universe, you cannot bless them. My goodness. Amen. That is that is so powerful. So as I was preparing for this interview, I had an out-of-the-box question to ask you, Dr. Adams. What would the church look like right now if people were fully walking in forgiveness to God, forgiveness to self, and forgiveness to others? Uh, well, I, I think you'd have to be have a prophetic vision to see that. Uh, perfect love cast out fear. Unforgiveness, bitterness, and anger act as a threefold cord that's not easily broken. It actually becomes a spiritual cancer that devours the love that's shed abroad in our heart. So in order to answer that question, to the best of my ability, I would say all you have to do is open the New Testament and Jesus. And that's what it would look like. You broke up a little bit there, Dr. Adam. Can you repeat that last comment? <laughs> I said, if you really want to know the answer to that question, open your Bible to the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, and then the book of John, and just read about Jesus. When you look at Jesus, that's what church should look like. Mm -hmm. So if what you said, they would just look like Jesus. Amen. That's, that's fantastic. We have about seven, eight minutes left. So a couple, couple more things I'd like to touch on. And that is, let's do some, let's do some praying for some folks. Would you like to pray, Dr. Adams, for, I just have a feeling that a lot of people are, are really excited about what you're saying. They want to be blessed. They want to be healed. They want to be victorious. But they know that, you know, after this broadcast, that that could be a difficult bridge for them to cross. <laughs> I wish we had another hour, my brother. I tell you, yeah. You're stepping from forgiveness into healing and deliverance. It, it's just uh, all the the word of God and what Christ did when He said it's finished. Oh, most people don't even know what He really meant. It's finished. See, just like I told you, that we honor our Father because of His position, not because of the performance. When you, come to, when you come to the Father God, Jesus said, and a lot of people don't like this, but Jesus said, no longer pray to me, but go to the Father in my name. So 
there's a couple of scriptures that says, come boldly into the throne room. This is to the Father, not to Jesus. Come boldly into the throne room to the Father in your time of need. Most people don't go because the natural fallen instinct, animal nature of man is to hide like Adam did in the garden. Okay. We hide from God instead of run to God. So what we're looking at now is when it says come boldly to the throne room in our time of need, time of need must mean we need something, we're lack of something, we're void of something. So the, the true interpretation of that in the original language is we're messed up. We've been in sin. We need, in our time of need, we need grace. Grace, we are saved by grace through faith, not of any works of ourselves. So when we come boldly for grace, that means because we've sinned. First John 1 9 says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. So check this out. We don't come by our performance. We come by Christ's performance. His righteousness allows us to enter when we're in need and our personal physical uh, performance isn't sufficient. But we come because of our position now in Christ. We are a new creation. Because of the performance of Christ, it puts us in a position that we can come boldly to the throne room. Now check this out. I love this. If you're born again, you're a new creation in Christ. If you receive the Holy Ghost, you now become the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, then you personally, your soul, your personality, has become the landlord of that temple. If you're the landlord of that temple, then you have eviction power and you really, in the name of Jesus, the dominion and authority, according to Luke 10, 19, behold, I've been given all power to tread over serpents and scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. That authority and power, we can evict arthritis, bursitis, fibromyalgia, insanity, mental instability, because according to the court of heaven, the word is recorded there, registered there under the blood of Jesus. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. You might think I'm crazy, but I got a sound mind because I'm believing just like Christ. So I pray this prayer, and I want to do this with people right now. Amen. It's the most supernatural prayer that can be prayed anywhere. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen blind eyes open, multiple deaf mutes, just so many miracles. Not because I'm strong, but because I'm weak. When you are weak, he is made strong. And I gave place and room to God by his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He did these miracles, but he used my vocal cords and my hands. So now, uh, those who would think raising the dead, that's a cool miracle. The greatest miracle is to become born again. So if you're listening and you're born again, you just told me you have faith for the greatest miracle. Everything mm -hmm. else you need is less. Oh, my. I just preached. Yeah, you did. You dropped you the your of faith. Quit having faith in your faith and have faith in God. Don't even have faith in Jesus because Jesus said, uh, have faith in God. We got to listen to the word the way this happens. You've not had trouble getting your prayers answered because of the absence of faith, but it's probably because of the presence of doubt with your faith. Jesus says, if you believe in doubt, not hmm. great teaching on how my unbelief, you can get on my website and find that. But I want you to know right now, we're going to pray a prayer, getting rid of forgiveness toward God, toward self, toward other. Then we're going to make a new commitment to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray and then give you an opportunity to repeat after me. Let's go now. Dear Heavenly Father, I make a conscious decision to forgive every person that's ever hurt me. I even forgive myself. God, if I've been mad at you, I've judged you wrongly. Forgive me. I let all the past go right now in Jesus' name. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he came to this earth in the flesh, and he is the only way of salvation. There is no other man, no other prophet, no other name. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. 
be my healer, my deliverer, my provider. Jesus, I believe you are the great I am. You're not the great I was. You are resurrected alive today. I make a new commitment to Jesus right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I believe uh, if you weren't born again, you just become born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, who was a Jewish man, Jesus was a Jewish man, of the lineage of David. Uh, David, read Matthew. Uh, Matthew was writing to Jewish people. There's over 100 references to Old Testament scriptures. He told a Jewish rabbi, he said, you must be born again. Jesus was born of a virgin, just like the prophecies. If you have Jewish lineage and the elders of Israel, people have told you that Jesus is not the Messiah. Yes, he is. And Elijah did come before him, and Jesus said it was John the Baptist, and the same anointing, same spirit is what that scripture means. So Elijah had come, and Jesus is the Messiah. And on the third day, he did rise from the dead. I go to Israel every January for the first week to seek God at the Sea of Galilee or in Jerusalem. Second week, I minister to Messianic churches, partnering with Israel, partnering with heaven, and I hope and believe now partnering with you. So if you become born again for the first time or you've been backslidden or you just know you've been cold, you made that fresh commitment. If you've never been water baptized as one of the first steps of obedience, you need to become part of a local body and church. Submit underneath a fivefold minister. Allow them to equip you, which means to train you so that you can live a life that Christ died for. There's a passage in the Bible that says, God says, for Christ's sake. That means don't let my son have been beat and died in vain. Just don't, it's not a buffet. Just don't go and get forgiveness of sins so that when you die, that uh, one day you'll be able to spend eternity in heaven. And yes, he did die for that. And yes, you will. But he also died for your now. He's concerned about your pain, your finances, your character. He's more concerned about transforming you and changing you to godly character than he is concerned about using you for ministry. You must first bring yourself to a point of obedience before you can bring others to obedience. Allow the processes of sanctification through the blessed Holy Spirit to happen in your life. God loves you. He does wonderful things in spite of me because of the grace of our Father in heaven. Amen. Big amen to that, Dr. Adams. I really felt the presence of God on that prayer. So. Um, we're going to wrap this up. I do have a quick testimony, though. Uh, okay. maybe, uh, Carter Longmire says that sometime back you were in Ohio and you ministered a prophetic word to her that she was going to bring other family members to Christ. So at this point, two brothers and one sister are now saved. Oh, what? praise God. I guess one of my 50% set was right. <laughs> I, I called her Omar. I'm so proud of you. Keep up the great work. Yeah. Oh, oh, the angels in heaven were rejoicing. The Father's so proud of you. You, If nobody's told you today, let me tell you, you are awesome. I love you so much. I'm Amen. glad you tune in tonight. Amen. So, Dr. Adams, do you have any events coming up that you'd like to share about? Um, next Saturday and Sunday, I'll be in Zanesville, Ohio, at the Rock Church in Zanesville, Ohio. You can just get on my Facebook, Brian Adams, and you'll see, uh, just like I advertise this event, uh, I will be advertising that uh, in uh, the Rock Church in Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, it'll be seven o'clock uh, Friday, uh, excuse me, uh, seven o'clock Saturday night and ten o'clock on Sunday morning. We will play. Uh, it's a little small country church up there, wonderful people. It's one of our churches that my pastor, Pastor David, uh, covers up there. Uh, pastor Aaron Wall, a wonderful pastor, and his lovely wife and kids. They're doing a great work for God there. But no matter how many people come, 
I always stay till the last person's prayed for. That's right. You'll get personal prayer ministry. We'll sit down chairs, give me a couple of cold waters and put a fan on me, give me a towel in case I sweat. And I'm like, I believe Jesus always stays till the last one, so I will too. Love to have you come. I'm located in Jackson, Ohio, which is only about two, depending on traffic, two and a half hours from Cincinnati. You go straight on 32 to where 35 Junction. During the week, I'm in my office or at my home. If you contact me and say, I can't make it to a service, but we need prayer. We have pain. We have sickness, disease, whatever. I've had a, a multiple people come from Cincinnati, come to a church service, or just come during the week. Uh, one lovely couple, the, the uncle, had a uh, bad shoulder. God healed him instantly. Uh, uh, his sister, uh, she was healed of something. <clears throat> and her son was probably about uh, seven or eight years old. Uh, didn't talk. Maybe said, Mom, Dad, that was it. But at his age, he should have been talking. No sentences. Uh, didn't act like he was paying attention. At the end, she goes, oh, I don't believe I didn't bring him up front. Could you pray? We're sitting in the back in the cafe. I laid hands on him and prayed a prayer. Right then, we didn't see any difference. They get in the vehicle, going down the road. The uncle's sitting in the back with him. He loved his uncle. He looks over. Now, this guy didn't talk, right? He looks over his uncle and says, hey, won't you ask mom if on the way home she'll stop and we can go to McDonald's? He said, well, that sounds like a good idea. All of a sudden, he's like, wait a minute. He just talked. Yes. Ooh. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? See, I was preaching one time, and I had a vision. I don't have many visions, but I had a vision where Christ was tied to the whipping post, and his back was bleeding and skin was hanging from it. And in the vision, I understood that his back became a portal or a window. Mm. The atmosphere of heaven was released through his back onto this earth. You know, the scripture says when you bring the tithes and offerings to the storehouses, I'll open you the windows of heaven. But if we slow down, he says, I'll open you the window of heaven. You and I can become windows that from the spirit realm to the natural realm, God's goodness and love can be released to his people. Yes, that is an awesome teaching. And on Dr. Adam's Facebook page, you have other resources. Are there? Is there another place? Where you folks can go to www.brian with an I, brianadamsministries.com. You can find all my social media links. You can uh, email me a message there. And like I said, you can set up an appointment to come. And, and let me let me get this out there. Uh, I, I love doing prayer lines. People getting healed. We had a lady in Illinois the other day. I was with the uh, uh, Apostle Tony Kemp, Kevin Zadai. It was their meeting. I was just visiting. Tony Kemp's a good friend of mine. And Dean Braxton, who'd been dead for an hour and 45 minutes when his wife prayed him back. So there were some mm -hmm. people there. And I just sat down like, oh, I want to I want to watch. But my friend Tony always has me pray for people. He's like, go over to this guy. Go over to this guy. A lady had a tumor the size of an egg in her breast. God dissolved that tumor. I think she had two. One of them had totally dissolved. The other one, two-thirds, it went down. And I said, well, we're going to believe for the, for the uh, one, the two-thirds left, he's going to heal. She was walking away, and I said, hey. And she turned around and looked. I said, I just want to remind you, you won't get a bill in the mail. So if you come up during the week when I'm here or even at a meeting, you don't have to, get, you don't have to give an offering. I can't receive payment when God heals you. The price has been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Someone one time said, man, I got a healing. Uh, and they got their money. How much do I owe you? I said, man, are you trying to get me to, uh, in sin and in trouble? I can't take money. It, you know, if someone wants to bless my ministry, it's different. But to say I'm going to pay you for this, no. We just want you to be pain free, to have the benefits that Christ has provided for you. I love being used by God to become the answer to people's prayers. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adams. You took us really deep and you took us really wide. I think we're seeing some, I think we're, we're seeing an HD, <laughs> some things that we weren't even thinking about before the <laughs> broadcast. Woo. HD, you talking about my Harley Davidson? Come on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I told y'all we're going to have fun. Um, thank thank you, you. It was an honor to be on your, on your program. You're such an awesome man of God. 
I, I'm proud to be able to call you my friend. However I can serve you, let me know. Absolutely. Um, next week, we will have doctors Tom and Susan Katenkamp. They will be teaching forgiveness in family relations. So in family relationships. So until then, I just pray that you have a blessed week. I pray that you would meditate on these truths that Dr. Adams has so graciously shared with us tonight. Be blessed, forgive, love, and be free in Jesus' name. See you next week at Open Heaven.